give the message on this Sunday. And I, I said I would be happy to do that. During the course of the weekend, I heard this song. And I thought, wow, this is such a great song. I wonder what the lectionary reading for today is. So a fellow had a computer there, and I went to the common lectionary, and I read this passage from Galatians. And I smiled. God is so good. And I want to share that with you. And of course, I was using my sermon as the place mark, so as I took it out, <laughs> I lost my place. This is a slightly different reading of Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. But I sometimes find that two different translations are helpful for me to gain insight into a scripture passage. So this is from the New Internet, the New American Standard Bible. But before, it came, before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have closed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither, neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendant, heirs according to the promise. Let us consider the immediate situation that Paul confronts in his letters to the people of the province of Galatia, for it asks the most basic question that humanity has posed for thousands of years. The Old Testament of the book of Job, chapter 25, verse 4, puts the, this question like this. How then can a man be righteous before God? The young and emerging church was locked in bitter conflict. The true meaning of Jesus' death, life, and resurrection was ill-defined at best at this time, and poorly understood, if at all. There was a continual disagreement between the Jewish believers, on one hand, who insisted that because Jesus was a Jew, who loved the Hebrew Scriptures and came to proclaim the good news to the Jewish people, and since Jesus was the promised Messiah, then Gentile converts must become Jewish before they became Christians. And Paul, on the other hand, who insisted that faith alone put the believer right with God, that faith alone saves us, and the gift of grace was intended for all of humanity without exception. Now keep in mind that the law that Paul refers to is not simply a few dietary restrictions, such as abstaining from pork and shellfish and rabbit, or observing a few holy days. You don't have that. I'm not eating a rabbit. That was against the law, right? Yeah. Or it was not male circumcision. But instead, the law of the Jews was a highly complex organization of restrictions, duties, and customs that controlled and guided every aspect of daily life, including economic consideration, how a farm was to be run, political organization, the garments that were to be worn, the relationships between different groups, how your food was to be cooked. It was, in short, all-encompassing. You had to know the law and observe it in its entirety, or you could risk falling out of God's favor. In Judaism, God was thought as forgiving only the repentant sinner who followed their repentance with right living. And God's holiness accepted those who obeyed his laws and punished those who did not. Paul explains that the law was both custodial and preparatory. That is, the law 
establish a standard to live by and restrain unsocial or predatory behavior, and that the law created people hungry for God's presence in their life. I want you to think about the laws that restrain our behaviors. Joy and I recently, my Sunday afternoon, that got back from a vacation. We left here, and in two weeks we drove down to San Diego, and then over to Tucson, visiting one child and his family in San Diego, visiting another child and, and his family in, San Diego, in Tucson, and then driving back here. A lot of driving. But I never get tired of my 15. It's really kind of a beautiful highway, especially this time of year as you're going through Montana and then Idaho and Utah, down into Nevada. Las Vegas is an amazing place. Amazing. Glad I don't live there. <laughs> it was a lot of driving. Um, and I noticed on that highway, particularly in the stretch of highway from Las Vegas down into Los Angeles, that there were two groups of motorists on the highway. There were those of us who were doing the speed limit or exceeding it slightly, and those people who were unrestrained by any <laughs> sense of speed limit on, on that highway, and they would sit by us, driving along at 75, 80 miles an hour, and people would go by us like we were standing still. <laughs> I thought, wow, it's probably dangerous. Total disregard of the speed limit. And occasionally you would see one of these uh, very bright red, a uh, rescue red cars pull over on the side of the road from the top behind it, like Spider-Man, right? But the purpose of the speed limit law is to move down people down the highway safely and efficiently. The people who disregard that speed limit create a danger for themselves and for everybody else who gets in their way. So you try real hard not to get out in their way, right? <laughs> Most of us accept and recognize the validity of the law, not out of fear, but respect. Respect for ourselves, respect for the people who dare to be on the highway with us. We accept the limits. We are not constrained by them. But it makes sense to us. That law makes sense to us, those of us who are moving along in a mere 75. <laughs> that is the purpose of the law. That we are grounded and guided out of respect. But it is also the limitation of the law. Because we so easily disregard something that we find inconvenient. Paul understood that the law is secondary to faith, or our hearts will be changed through faith. Not out of an imposed and easily disregarded law. After all, he knew the Hebrew scriptures that on faith alone, Abraham was regarded as righteous before God. And then he makes a startling observation that faith was not limited to just one group of people, but that through faith, all people may experience the grace of God. This was revolutionary stuff during Paul's time, and it is revolutionary today. We are still struggling to, oh, to come to grips with the idea of this overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. The struggle is particularly acute for those of us in the United Methodist Church right now. Groups of people continue to do their best to try to limit God's grace and access to God's <coughs> grace. We will never be able to do that. For grace is simply greater than our vision, our capacity. Grace, God's grace is not only greater than we imagine it to be. God's grace is greater than we are capable of imagining it to be. Let me restate verse 28 in more contemporary terms. <clears throat> there is neither white nor black, conservative or liberal, 
there is neither strait nor gay, native or migrant, there is neither Catholic nor Methodist, politically correct nor incorrect, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Friends, faith in Christ supersedes our identity with an exclusive group. For God loves the other as fervently as God loves each one of us. This is the supreme manifestation of God's holiness. That God loves us, forgives us, recreates us anew, all without any merit whatsoever on our part. Not because we have done anything to deserve this outpouring of grace, but because we need it. And we are helpless to gain the thing that we need the most. All we can do is accept this gift of grace and forgiveness and come into the presence of God knowing that we are loved and be grateful. God bless you all. Amen.